Hi, it's Tony Chapman, and welcome to Chatter That Matters. It's a podcast where we cut through the clutter to focus on what matters most to your life and your livelihood. Thanks to the incredible support of RBC, we are focusing the next 10 episodes on the heart of our economy, small businesses. Small business matters, and it's in our collective interest to keep them beating strong. We'll travel across Canada. We'll meet small business owners across a number of industry sectors, tourism and hospitality, healthcare, technology, and many, many more. We'll learn about the owners' dreams and aspirations and their challenges and how they're managing since COVID-19 has essentially shut down our economy. We'll then seek the advice of some of Canada's top thought leaders to provide the entrepreneur, well, all of us with timely and much needed insights, ideas, and inspiration. Small business matters. RBC and I both believe that when we personalize an individual story, we also take their challenges and quests personally. In doing so, we'll continue to rally support and commitment for this very important sector. This week, you're going to get to know a fabulous person, Lisa Taylor. Her company's name, Challenge Factory. And Lisa has the attributes I admire in entrepreneurs. She's resourceful and resilient with the self-confidence you need when starting or scaling a business. Welcome to Chatter That Matters, Lisa. Thanks so much, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, I was doing a little background work on on this interview and part of starting Challenge Factory, your resume had big names on it. The one that really stands out is Hewlett Packard, where you spent over eight years leading many impressive projects nationally and globally. But what I was most interested in is this insight that you uncovered about mid-career staff that became well, foundational for your entrepreneurial ventures many years later. So tell me a little bit about this mid-career staff. Earlier in my career, I led a fairly large team, 135 consultants, project managers, technical people that loved their job. And they were incredible. They were exceptional at their job. Their customers loved them. They loved the people that they worked with. But all of them would admit that it had been a long time since they had actually felt some kind of challenge in their work. When I would ask them, what do they want to do next? They would say to me, Lisa, now is not the time for me to think about what I want to do next. That'll come in the future. For now, I just need to hang in there. And for someone who didn't even have 10 years of a career behind them, the idea of hanging in there for 10 years was terrifying to me. And in a country that's worried about productivity levels, what does it mean that the vast majority of my team were successful but not satisfied and just hanging in. That really intrigued me and it turned my career, which had been mainly technical until that point, to really focus on what are the human dimensions of work and where are we missing something that we really need to tap into. Insights are how people think, feel and behave. It's their their head, heart and hands. It's, It's the lifeblood of innovation. It's what entrepreneurs feed from. Knowing where your your audience is and where they need to go and helping them get there. And when Lisa frames this incredible insight on people, and we all feel that sometimes, we're we're successful, but we're not satisfied. We're just hanging in there. We're we're working for the mortgage. She sees an opportunity. So Lisa, you see this opportunity. What do you do about it? I'm a researcher at heart. Um, And so I wanted to make sure that this wasn't just my observation. I spoke with a lot of my team members and heard to a person that, you know, in terms of their future, they were waiting. They were waiting for, as you say, their mortgage to be paid off or waiting for their kids to graduate from post-secondary, waiting for it to be their time to reimagine what they might want to be doing in the future. And I thought about what is the mental health aspect of coming into a job every single day, knowing it's not exactly what you necessarily want to be doing, but feeling like you have to keep at it. What does it mean that there seemed to be a whole cohort that was just waiting for something to come along next, but weren't taking any active steps to make it happen? How does that affect our country's productivity? And that really bothered me. It bothered me enough, actually, that it, it, helped me to see that there was something more for me to explore. And that became the origin point for Challenge Factory. So what you took, though, was about six years before you actually made the leap into entrepreneurship. So tell us a little bit about what happened during those six years and what was the thing that finally got you to climb on that high wire? 
in around 2003, I became really interested in this successful but not satisfied trend and started to do some research. I pulled together some people that I respected and admired, worked in the fringes and nights and on weekends. I did some research. I did some reading. I reached out to counterparts in countries around the world, and I continued to build my own knowledge, not necessarily feeling like the timing was right for me to step away from my own safe corporate career that was doing really well in order to become an entrepreneur for the very first time. So who kicked you out of the nest? Because I was talking to you earlier and I had to put a big smile on my face because I'm a dad of daughters. And so tell me a little bit about your father's role. It was uh, in 2009 when my father had a conversation with me and he said, six years is long enough that either this idea is one that I'm going to pursue and see if it works out, or I need to just keep on the shelf and know that maybe that's never going to happen. And his, uh, his impetus for that was he had worked for a large company for most of his career until he had ended up getting forced out of the company. And so he had had to pursue entrepreneurship much later in life. And what he realized was he wished he had done it sooner. So seeing that I had that bit of the bug, he really pushed me to do everything that I could to take that risk and to give it a try, knowing that at least in the first couple of years, you can always go back. And I'm so grateful for that push. It made all the difference in the world. That's a big shout out to dads, which I like. 2011, you decide to go on your own. What was it like to wake up one day and realizing you didn't have 120 people working for you, didn't have the resources? It was uh, terrifying and exciting all at the same time. Uh, And I remember those days so clearly, so sharply, when you realize you can do whatever you want, because it it really is up to me to decide what I wanted to put my attention and focus on. But that doesn't mean that what I want to do is always right. And I needed to find ways to put controls and systems to get other people around me So that when I was going off in a direction that wasn't going to be the most useful, there was at least some control so that I really stayed focused on what I needed to do to build this company. So your your business is based on success, not satisfied. And what I'm hearing is an early entrepreneur, you had little success, but we're very satisfied. (laughs) I think that's a good way to put it. One of the things I read about your business is that you said it's not traditional. It's it's not easy to buy. It's almost a square peg in a round hole because customers frame this kind of work a certain way and we were doing very different work. Tell me a little bit about how you positioned your company, why it wasn't traditional and how you overcame that challenge. Within North America and within Canada, we fit as an HR firm, but we don't do HR. We come from the discipline of career development, which is a lifelong intersection point of human human work, activity, identity, talent, and the labor market. So not quite HR. We offer individualized career management, exploration, and advancement services, but we're not an outplacement company because we don't see career management and career counseling as something that only happens in crisis. We see it as something that everyone needs to continually do on an ongoing basis. And finally, we're a firm that's focused on the future of work. We have very specific models and drivers that analyzes how we might be able to shape the future of work, but we're not a technology firm. And most future of work conversations start with the technology where we start with the humanity. And so we're almost like a whole lot of different other types of sectors, industries, and companies, but we're not exactly like. And that makes it a real challenge for people to understand exactly what they get when they work with Challenge Factory. So as a classic entrepreneur developing unmet needs, uncharted territory, they have to find a way to convince the customer to buy. The customer is used to framing a business one way or another way, but not necessarily Challenge Factory way. How did you get over that impasse of getting customers to realize that even though it was an uncharted path, 
it might be the best path forward in terms of creating success and energy and enlightenment with employees. I spent a lot of time focused on who are other players that can vouch for us, that can get to know us, that can provide us with added heft to uh, be able to say, you know what, Lisa and her team actually are the real deal. They can help you with those projects. And so digging into the career development sector and industry, becoming known in post-secondary institutions where research is being done, doing work with major significant government departments, getting to know people that would be able to help refer us and recommend us became a critical component to that. And then from a marketing side, really leaning into seeing what is it that would help us provide commentary and smart information to the media, not in a pay for play way, but because we actually legitimately had unique research statistics and information to be able to share. Where could we build up what we were doing so that we weren't the only ones telling our story? This is a brilliant move if you're an entrepreneur. When you start off with a brand name that's unknown, think about the company you keep. What Lisa does is she works with people with influence, people that can put a stamp of approval on her research and her thinking. She goes to the media and provides really good thought leadership, not about her company, but what matters most to their readers, to their viewers. And finally, she goes out on a speaking tour and writes books. So you combine the three of them and all of a sudden a known brand becomes well known. What will be success for you five years, 10 years out? Big success for me is that Canada thrives in the future of work. That we stop waiting for other people to define what that future will look like and then scramble to prepare for it. And instead we shape a future by industry, by company, by sector, by individual. We shape the future that we all want to be working in. If there's any way that Challenge Factory has influenced that in any small piece that it may have played, that's a win for me. That's success for me. When you listen to an entrepreneur that has a greater sense of purpose, they're there to serve a much greater cause. In this case, Canada's productivity. Finding an environment where we're hiring people. You pay attention to that type of entrepreneur because you know when they're in business for the right thing. Your business is very proactive. It's very strategic. It's about the future of work. Our future is being put on hold. COVID-19 hits like a sledgehammer to the economy. What's happened to your business since this virus has taken hold of us? And what adjustments are you making to make sure that you don't lose sight of that great dream? I'll admit that it's not a great feeling to have been through the startup phase of a business and gotten to the scaling and growth phase, which is easier. The pressure of the day-to-day, what's gonna happen next month? Do I have the funds? Are we at risk? Can I pay my people? All of those types of up in the middle of the night type of issues fall a little bit behind you into your past. And I do have to admit in the last couple of weeks, that actually has been something that has returned back again. And that, that is something that is not a great feeling. But by reaching out to my customers, by really focusing on my business, by understanding exactly what we have, what reserves we have, what opportunities we have, and by getting really creative to say, what is this moment calling on Challenge Factory's expertise specifically to be able to do, even if it's not something that was on our radar a month ago? So we have started to take a look and say, what should we be offering maybe just in the short term, that doesn't become a permanent part of what we do, but helps others overcome the challenges that they're facing right now. Lisa, you're not alone. Most businesses have been turned upside down by COVID-19. But even prior, you're struggling with being that square peg in a round hole, that's positioning. And your conviction, you know your research can help employees and companies, but you think it can ladder to improving the overall productivity of Canada's economy. That's a tall order. So let me track down the best and brightest brains who can help you. I must give a huge shout out to RBC for sponsoring the Small Business Matters series on Chatter That Matters and for running excerpts on 67 radio stations across Canada. I'm a big fan of RBC. 
And not just because they're one of the world's best run and most respected banks. It's because of what they do to help all of Canada. Take Future Launch, a $500 million investment to help Canadian youth find and pursue their path in life. Or the investment RBC makes in arts and culture, in amateur sports, and in building our new economy. When COVID-19 hit, RBC stepped up with millions of dollars to support food banks and essential services. And they had only one ask for this series. Don't make this show about RBC. Make it about the small business heroes. And speaking of heroes and their quest, let's get back to see what the experts have to say. Lisa, this is the part of the podcast that I love. I get to share advice from some of Canada's thought leaders on your business of doing business. Earlier, you mentioned being a square peg in a round hole. You weren't easy for a customer to frame. So the first person I went to is Canada's top positioning expert, Beverly Hammond from the agency Broken Heart Love Affair. Before we got into your positioning, I first said to Bev, what do you think of her overall business? I love Lisa's business, and I think Lisa has a really big opportunity right now. This is a time for most businesses that is at best uncertain and very confusing. You have some concerns, though, on her positioning and focus. Her business is really interesting, but she offers a lot of services. I think she really needs to narrow cast and focus on what it is she can offer leaders and businesses today, how she can help employees and how how she can help employers. And this one might be tough for you, Lisa, because remember, Beverly's one of Canada's best when it comes to positioning. I asked her what she thought of your name, Challenge Factory. Challenge Factory is a clever name but it doesn't reflect the benefit that the organization offers business leaders and businesses today. If she can change her name to reflect the benefit, that would be great. If she cannot, then she should consider a tagline that describes very simply what it is she provides and the benefit she can provide to employers and businesses at this time. Lisa, that's some tough advice. I mean, narrow your focus, even consider rebranding. What are your thoughts? So I'm actually quite grateful for the advice that Beverly has given, and it's not uh, out of line with other things that our team has talked about over the years and time. Certainly at this moment in time, I agree with her. I think we do need to focus, and we're working very hard to do that so that we can really focus on where we can provide the most value to the most people at this complex moment in time. The topic of the brand and of the company name also comes up. So that debate between does the name have to be exactly what you do so it's easy or can it be something else that's uh, representative of your brand is an interesting challenge for a very small business and I appreciate her perspective on that. You also challenged me to find a research-based consulting company that could give you advice on how to move forward. So I tracked down Kelly Peters, who's the CEO of BE Works. She's a pioneer in behavioral science. She's got one of the most exciting consulting companies in North America. Again, I asked Kelly first off, what did she think of your business? She's got a very strong foundation and she's established a purpose and linked her passion with purpose. But the next thing that organizations need from my experience is understanding what kind of results they can expect. And the sooner you can get to talking about results, even if they're not from the same industry, uh, people can actually be very flexible and lateral thinking and go, okay, so you've done that in that industry. I can see where that might help me in my unique situation. And then I said to Kelly, so results is really all she needs? Helping people understand the process that you used in order to arrive at those results so that they can see that kind of consistency in your thinking and that it's not necessarily an ad hoc approach, but instead you're using something that's very methodical and it's tried and and tested. I was fascinated when you talked about the work that you do at Challenge Factories, not only to improve the productivity of the individual and the company, but can ladder up to improve the productivity of a nation. So I asked Kelly, is this too big of a goal or is this something she can use to build her brand? I think that she's spot on with that. Aspiration is a great way to open the door to keep everybody motivated through that conversation on why we're even talking in the first place. But then the next thing is that, you know, what are the steps and what is the impact that I can expect? What I like about what Kelly Peters is talking about 
is process and proof. And that comes from her background at BE Works. It's very much the scientific process. And I know you're very research focused. So I'm, I'm curious at how you feel about weaving into the narrative. It's not just what we do, but here's the proof on how it works. I'm smiling as I'm, uh, as I'm feeding this back to you and as I'm responding back. I'm always the one that is the most protective of our clients. And so uh, we don't typically put out stories of what we've done with clients because we're improving their productivity. It's their story. It's their story to tell. And sometimes it's quite proprietary of what the challenge was that they originally hired us. So crossing that line between what is a story for Challenge Factory to tell and what was an engagement with a client that really isn't a public story, I'm always um, far more conservative on that side than I actually need to be. If we were to ask our clients, they would say, no problem, you can tell our story, we're happy to have you tell it. But we don't ask that often enough. And so I appreciate that we need to do more storytelling with the great work that we've done. Her comment about the ability to demonstrate process and the consistency in thinking is so interesting given the original uh, feedback that we were given, that we were just talked about from Beverly on the name of the company. The reason the name of the company is Challenge Factory is because factories have processes. There are ways that things get addressed, even as you're working it through. So that process approach, that step-by-step -step methodology and the consistency and the way that things get handled is core to what we do. Another area you wanted advice on is how to leverage social media to build communities. Interesting enough, working with RBC over the last couple of weeks, I am blown away by how they build communities of interest. Mm -hmm. So I went to one of their leaders, Caroline Paxton, who's the Vice President of Media Strategic Initiatives at RBC. I asked Caroline, you've looked at the social channels she posts on. Any thoughts? Looks like Lisa posts on four social accounts now. She uses Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And I would recommend that she consider focusing on two or three platforms, you know, that make the most sense for the audience that she's trying to attract and populate those channels often. So narrow the number of channels, but do you have any preference on which ones? I think since Lisa has a B2B business, I would recommend that LinkedIn be one of her primary channels going forward. And finally, she offered this unsolicited advice to you. She has a lot of uh, two to three minute videos on YouTube. And I think there's an opportunity for her to edit those down to potentially a few 30 second bite sized segments. Folks are much more apt to engage in shorter clips. And then she could use those on some of her other channels, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn, to deliver her messages in small segments. So Carolyn Paxton, she's an expert in social media and she really frames it all as less is more. What are your thoughts? I agree. I think as a, you know, as a business owner with lots of things to address, we always look to see how, how far do we need to be stretching our resources and our attention? Does it make sense to do a little bit everywhere or does it make more sense to focus in, uh, in a single uh, place? And I think that message of focus is one that is coming through from all of the experts, to be honest. Um, both in terms of, you know, what it is that we're doing, what messages we want to be conveying, where we're conveying those messages. That's actually one of the key takeaways that I'm taking from, uh, from all of the experts that we do a lot and we're good at it and we need to be more focused on what we really want to be famous for. I also really felt for you when you started talking about how you feel like a startup again, that COVID-19, instead of just talking about how am I going to deal with growth and momentum, you went back to those early days when you're thinking about payroll and, and, and just keeping the business on track. So I went back to Lori Darlington, who, who was so instrumental in helping Tracy Shepard in episode one. And I, first thing I asked her is, what can entrepreneurs do now to bring some certainty to their uncertainty? Things are changing every day. Scenario planning is key. Not only will it help to instill confidence in conversations with your financial institution, but it will also help Lisa make the right decisions for her business and take away some of that anxiety. And then I asked her if she had any more advice in terms of how you personally navigate through COVID-19. Being proactive and thinking through this is really important. It gives a sign of confidence and conviction when you're talking to your financial institution. But most importantly, it's going to help Lisa make the right decisions for her business. Lori offers some great advice to take the on away from uncertainty. 
It is good advice. I mean, certainly at a moment of uncertainty, uh, what you need to do, what I know we need to do is go back to what we know. And that's really what our team has been doing. We go back to what we know. We know that we are uh, well positioned and in good shape to be able to help a lot of businesses and a lot of organizations through this crisis. And so we've been very creative in reaching out and in creating new partnerships, actually, expanding the number of people that we're talking with and the number of people that we're working with so that we're not alone in this and we um, really thrive through this very disruptive period. Three things I learned from profiling Lisa Taylor at her challenge factory. One, Lisa, you're guided by a higher purpose. Hanging on and hanging in is how we describe a prison sentence. It should never be how we describe our work. Your quest to create a better future of work is something every employee, business, and country can rally around. Two, knowledge is power. You're research-based. You translate facts into narrative and in turn becomes your books and your speeches. The more the world looks to Lisa for leadership on the future of work, the more they'll look to the services you offer. But the third thing is, you're lost in translation. Being a square peg in a round hole might work in a booming economy, but in the future, you'll be fighting competitors for market share. Sharpen your positioning, even consider that rebrand to make your business easy to understand, easy to get excited about, and most importantly, easy to buy. Thanks for joining us in Chatter That Matters, Small Business Matters, presented by RBC. To find details on how RBC supports its business clients, visit rbc.com slash business. You've been listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. You can connect with Tony on Twitter at Tony Chapman, through LinkedIn at Tony Chapman Reactions, or visit his website, TonyChapmanReactions.com. Chatter That Matters is produced by Tony Chapman Reactions and Eye Contact Productions.